you and I who have decided to follow Jesus have decided to give our life in our hearts, but also to share that love with as many people as we can. Today we're going to talk with a man who has a very powerful world perspective on what it means to be a true missionary. Hi, my name is Father Mike Manning. God bless you. Thank you very much for watching this program. I think you are going to be touched, and I think that something can happen that might even change your whole life, your whole life with regard to the challenge of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I'm a member of a community, and it's called the Society of the Divine Word. It's a, it's a large missionary community. There are, there are over 6,000 members around the world. Um, our main goal is trying to get into the lives of people who don't know about Jesus and bring them the power of what that means to change their lives. But in this organization, um, we get together, oh, maybe every five or six years, and we try to choose someone that might give us a, a leadership role, a, a leadership that is also a real servantship, and trying to give us an insight into how we can move with the Spirit in a good way. And wow! We've got that man right with us. Heinz, God bless you. Thank you very much for coming and being with us today. Thank you, brother. We're very excited about knowing what this organization is. Uh, it's something we, we, we know of certain organizations in the Catholic Church. They're the Jesuits, and even the Holy Father was a member of that. There's Franciscans and there's Benedictines. But there's also a group of, of, of men and women who are involved with trying to share the good news of Jesus around the world. and. Uh, we're very proud to have you here as, as the leader, as the one who's come and been asked to now give us a direction in a good way. But before we get into that, would you tell us a little bit about your relationship with Jesus? My relationship with Jesus started many, many years ago. When I was a young man at the age of 15, I was looking for meaning in my life. Then it took about another two years before I found an answer to my question. So what's the meaning of my life? I heard about a very important man in France. He's the founder of a very famous movement called the Taizé movement. Ah, oh, yeah, I've been to Taizé in France. Powerful experience. That was a powerful experience for me too, looking for the meaning in my life. At the age of 17, I met the founder of that movement. His name is Frère Roger, brother Roger Schütz. So listening to him, he gave an answer to a question that I had for a long time. How can I give meaning to my life? So what he said is, you start to read the Bible. You try to find Jesus in the Bible. So you do not have to memorize the whole Bible, but look for one story that really touches your life, mm -hmm. and then try to live it. And what was the story that touched you especially? The story that touched my life was the story of the Samaritan. All of us would know that story. A man held up by robbers, and somebody passes by, a priest goes to the other side and disappears. Mm -hmm. A Levite passes by, and then somebody who's supposed not to help to pass by, who had all the excuses, a Samaritan, who was not obliged to help him, he stopped and helped him. And that story touched my life. So what what way? What, 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 why, why was that so significant, that story? Because I realize it's a very practical story. You can encounter Jesus in people who are in need of help. So when I came home, I started reading the Bible and I checked with the Old Testament to find a story that would really put me on the way and give meaning to my life. But then I came to the New Testament and story after story that I read did not yet answer my question until I came to Luke 10. And then I found that story of the Samaritan. I realized this is the story. It's mm -hmm. a very practical story to encounter Jesus in the poor, in people who are in need of help. So that story changed my life completely. In Germany too, my home place, we have a lot of people living in the streets. So instead of passing by, when I saw beggars, 
asking for food or asking for money, I stopped and did not only give food and money, but I asked for the name of that person. I listened to their stories and that touched me. I realized there's much more to a personal relationship with the poor than just giving food and giving money, but to build up a relationship in order to come in contact with the deeper dimension of our existence. How do we overcome our fear of that? Uh, that, that that's so difficult for us, isn't it? Are, are, you, are you with me on this? It's, yes. It's tough. It's tough. Because a lot of times we can come up with great excuses for putting them aside or ignoring them. How do, how, do, how do you get into that? I had the same experience at the beginning. I was hesitant approaching people. You know, the way they look very often, yeah. the way they smell. Yeah. I was afraid of getting infected with all kinds of diseases, but it was more than that. The strategy is to listen to my inner voice, mm. to hear what my inner voice tells me. And that inner voice, I believe, is the voice of God telling us to approach that person and then to find out what his life is all about. And that is how it happened, to come in contact with people who are in need of help. So it started in Germany, where I got in touch with the people. Without really helping the people, I realized in the process, it was the people that helped me, yes. namely to find meaning in life and also to come in contact with the deeper dimension of my existence, with God himself. So encountering Jesus in the poor. Tell me a little bit about this a step that you might have taken after that, you become a Catholic priest. How did that materialize? Uh, you know, you're 17 years old, you've encountered Jesus, and suddenly there's kind of a, he's, he's enwrapped himself around you. Was there a, was there a further commitment towards, towards possibly being a priest? It's a long way to go. I did not really? decide immediately to become a priest. It takes time. Eh? So I was listening to my inner voice and started to gather experiences. In the afterthought, all these encounters were preparations for becoming a priest, but I joined the congregation of the Society of the Divine Word only at the age of 23. So I started to study engineering, I became a professional, then I joined the army for two years, it's obligatory in Germany. So I had a lot of encounters and opportunities also to practice the story of the Samaritan, to encounter God, to encounter Jesus in people, who are in need. It was not always materially poor in the army. There were people who had tremendous experiences of suffering, mm. seeing friends dying, seeing friends not having meaning in life, friends committing suicide. I became a listener to people who had problems, personal problems, but also suffered because of the sufferings of friends. So I became a listener and then I realized slowly but surely that to become an engineer is not what I should do with my life. Mm. To become a soldier is not what I should do with my life. But I can do more. I can help others to have the same experience as I had. And I mean to discover meaning in life. Meaning in my life to encounter Jesus and the poor, to help others to have the same experience. Simplified, to learn to live biblical stories as Brother Roger Schutz had suggested to us young people also to me, when we were young, to look for a story in the Bible that will bring us in contact with the Lord himself. One time I had a chance of going to France. I was going to ours to visit uh, my patron saint, St. John Vianney. And as we were with some people and we drove and I said, oh, let's go to Tizé. And so you travel along this kind of hilly country. And there were, oh, there were some, a couple kids were just sitting, you know, playing, playing, playing with a Frisbee out in the field. And we drove in and I didn't see anything significant and so we got out of the car and we walked over just a little bit of a hill and all of a sudden I looked out and here were probably, I bet you there were 5,000 young people with all color hairs and all kind of stuff like this, quietly praying. And I thought, oh my gosh, isn't this beautiful? especially in our world today when we think of youth in terms of the commercialism and everything that seems to pull them away from God. They were, they were sitting, they were standing, and they were singing with their hearts in their love of God in a beautiful way. I just uh, throwing that in to you, yeah. that, that, that ties, to, as you say, to say, opened your heart. It, it touched me too, just, and uh, might, might have lasted an hour than I was there, but still it was strong. The it's the experience of many of us young people in those days to encounter silence. 
So a silence that we do not experience usually in our day-to-day -day life when we are busy with many different things. But silence is part of the experience of God himself. That was my experience in those days. After I encountered Taizé, and I encountered that story that would give meaning to my life, I realized very often that I have a great need for silence. So in many places where I went, I was looking always for places where I could in silence encounter the Lord himself in order to give direction to my life. That ain't very popular now. Right. Man, I got to have that earphone in and I got to get my computer going and I got to watch television and blah, 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 blah. But the silence is so powerful because yeah. that's where God can be found yeah. speaking in, in our hearts as we're doing that. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that you mentioned that I found interesting was when you started dealing with the poor, you found the simple thing of listening. And you and I as priests, we spend a lot of time preaching. <laughs> we're, we're letting our voices be heard. But boy, I, I really think that there's a, a deepening awareness in me of just the time of listening to people, not saying anything, you know, and just listening to them. And there's so many people that want to tell their stories. <laughs> And all they want, they're waiting for is a, is a good eye and a good ear to be willing to listen to what they're saying in a neat way. This Christmas, we want you to have a special gift, a votive candle holder. This beautiful votive candle holder features four contemporary vignettes illustrating the Christmas story. The angel Gabriel appearing to Mary with the good news that she is going to be the mother of the Savior. It depicts the struggle Mary and Joseph had. They had to go through to find a place for them to stay for the first Christmas. They had no room at the inn. The third illustration is of the three kings, the three wise men from the east, led by the star arrive at the manger to worship the newborn king of the universe. It can hold a votive candle inside or a three inch pillar candle that you can add to make it more elegant. It will be a wonderful teaching aid for you to tell the stories of Christmas to your children, a wonderful and elegant gift for you and your loved ones. We want to give you this gift for your gift of $20 or more. Call the number on the screen right now and place your order today. And make your Christmas a special one with the light of Christ through the votive candle holder. Call today. picked up the priesthood, um, you decided to, to join this community called Divine Word Missionaries. I want to get a little bit more. You're, you have a, a world perspective on this powerful group of men and women that are preaching the gospel. But I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to know a little bit about what work did you do as a priest up until now? Yeah, at the beginning I was assigned to the Philippines mm. as a missionary of the Divine Word. So my basic task initially was, of course, as always, to get to know a new culture, to learn a new language, not only one, but several languages, in order to yeah, get in touch with the people. Not only one, but several languages? Yes, Hello. we speak about five languages in the place where I was working, in the Philippine South. You had to learn five languages? Well, we have to At learn. At least be able to get through to people. Yes, it's, it's, it's a matter of getting to know a culture, it's getting to know a people. Yes, yeah, getting to know yeah, myself too. Ne? By encountering people, I get to know myself, my limitations, but at the same time also my own talents and gifts. So that was my first assignment in the Philippines. But soon I realized that the story that I had practiced in Germany became also a guide for me in encountering people in the Philippines. Because in uh, a very short period of time I discovered that there are many who need the Samaritan. So I encountered people living in garbage dumps, garbage dumping sites, garbage pits, there are different names for that. In Cebu itself I encountered in a, a garbage dumping site about 6,000 people, mm. so basically children. And again, as in the Samaritan story, I have two options. I can pass by, I can also stop. Mm. So in those days I heard the inner voice 
and the inner voice told me not to pass by, but to stop. So I decided to live with the people. So for quite a number of time, initially it was a month, and then it was for several years over weekends, I would become one of those that are living in the garbage dumps. I would scavenge for a living. And what um, I had the chance of being in Manila and going to yes. Smoky Mountain and spending a week, we did a television show there. Awesome experience, but frightening experience yeah. of people who are looking for, as the garbage trucks come in and unload their, their thing from the city of Manila, and you were talking about Cebu further to the yeah. south, looking for a piece of metal, looking for a piece of cardboard, looking for a piece of plastic that might be able to be sold to get food, mm. and all the time living in little makeshift huts on the garbage dumps. Mm. Wow. It was very often more than that. It was just people lo looking for recyclable materials that could be sold to buy food, but it was very often more than that, even looking for food in the garbage because there was yeah. not enough food. What was very touching for me was to see so many children younger than 10 years scavenging up to 8, 10, 12 hours each day. The most touching experience was to have to bury so many children that died. The first two years about 40 children died. So that really touched my heart. I realized I, I cannot pass by. I have to bring in more people. No? How did you help them? What, 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 what did you do in the midst of this overwhelmingly frightening situation? Yeah, the key first of all was not to be afraid. <sighs> to be convinced yourself that something can be done and that there will be a lot of good people that will be helping and that's exactly what happened. So the important message is that the poor can be helped, but only those that are willing to help themselves. The key to any... Well, say that again, I don't know, what do you mean? What do you mean only help themselves? It is not a matter of just giving something to the poor but it is a matter of coming into contact with people who are poor mm -hmm. to help them realize that they have a value, mm -hmm. that they are important although they are poor and they suffer poverty, to give meaning to their lives by listening to their stories, ah. to help them that they, in the Christian context, are also children of God, that they are loved by God, to help them to encounter God in themselves and to help them to realize that they have a dignity. So that was the important message. Because of that, they have realized they need education. Educating the poor basically means to help the children get a decent education, and through the children to educate the parents, who very often do yeah, not have any yeah, education. Yeah, yeah. And that is what happened. So the children got an education, the parents asked to be educated too, because they realized that education changed their children. So in that context, it is a matter of giving back the dignity that people have and that people are supposed to have because they are loved by God. That's the message. Every creature, independent of where I live, whether I'm a street child, whether I'm living in red light districts, whether I'm living in the garbage dump, every person is precious, is a child of God. And that is what I wanted to get across as a message to these people. I think that is the message that we have as Samaritans, not only to give something to people, but to help people to help themselves to rediscover their own dignity. Tell me a little bit now, if I may, I'd like to move into this question of um, how does this all fit in with this world that we, that we share as Divine Word missionaries, the Society of the Divine Word. Could you tell me a little bit about this organization? How did it get started? And uh, what is it doing? What kind of work is it doing in line with the dream that you've been on fire with, with regard to this Samaritan story. Yeah. So the order was founded in 1875 by a German priest. His name is Arnold Janssen. His idea was to bring people in contact with the Word of God, because for him it was very obvious that the Word of God can give meaning to our lives. Now we're not talking, when we talk about the Word, are we talking about just the Bible, or are we talking about, um, I, I know that in the Gospel of John, he starts off and he says, in the beginning was the Word, and it's not necessarily the Bible, but it's also... Jesus himself. Jesus himself. Yes, yes, yes. So for him it was important that people have a chance to get in touch with God himself. To get in touch with God is through the Bible. So that is, was uh, his message, to find ways and means to help people to fall in love 
with mm. the word in that case to fall in love with the Lord and make the Lord part of his life the divine word the divine word the divine people word. making God more and more part of the life so what Arnold Janssen particularly wanted is to help people who have never heard about the Lord himself so that's why he founded this congregation to help people yeah to learn to love the Lord by reading the Word of God. Mm. So for us, for me today particularly, it is biblical stories that can change our lives. Like for me it was the Samaritan story, today there are many other stories. For me the Sermon on the Mount is a good program I can live as a missionary. For me that's the key that I believe can help many people to find meaning in life. There are many practical stories that I can live in my day-to-day -day life. E even today to yes. talk about Ruth, and from the Old Testament, all of a sudden leaving her own country and having to go into a yeah. foreign country, as we yeah. talked about the refugees, refugees yes, and yes, whatnot, yes, yes. Yeah, to, yeah, to yeah, live yeah, in a foreign yeah. country. Yeah, what uh, that means. Like Abraham himself, you know, trying to find meaning, trying to find a new life for people who cannot live where they used to live for decades and generations. So that is what the Bible basically offers. There are many, many stories that yes. I can put into action in my day to day life. If uh, the woman caught in the act of adultery, not to throw stones, who are we to judge? Mm -hmm. Who are we to judge people who are different than us? So that is a clear biblical message. That's what God wants us to do. So he does not want us to judge people, because it's ultimately him who can judge what he has created. So in that context, biblical stories like the Samaritan story, as well as the story of the woman caught in the act of adultery. Who am I to throw the first stone, looking at my own life and my own limitations? Again, the Sermon on the Mount, to realize my own limitations before God, that ultimately, in spite of all my wills, I'm not really rich. In the sight of God, I'm a very precious person. It's not my wills, my belongings that make me to the precious person. It's just my being a human person. And that is independent of whether I'm rich or whether I'm poor. I'm loved by God. That's the Sermon on the Mount, the first beatitude. Blessed are those that are poor before God. To realize and to accept once and for all that I am precious in the eyes of God, not because of what I own, but because of what I am. So you're telling me that if, if, if I want to be a divine word missionary, I've got to almost be obsessed with the poor. The poor are very important for God himself. For us at this point in time, it has become our motto. We are living among the people and putting the last first. That includes, of course, the environment. We do not pass by as some Samaritans when the environment suffers. So we do both. We take care of the poor, we take care of the environment. We do not pass by because there is a need to intervene. So for us, that's a very important message at this point in time as Divine Word missionaries. We are concerned about the people. We are concerned about the people who are suffering. We are concerned about the environment that is suffering. And we want people to learn to live and to love biblical stories. Biblical stories that help our people to fall in love with the Lord himself, to encounter the Lord himself in the poor. This Christmas, we want you to have a special gift, a votive candle holder. This beautiful votive candle holder features four contemporary vignettes illustrating the Christmas story. The angel Gabriel appearing to Mary with the good news that she is going to be the mother of the Savior. It depicts the struggle Mary and Joseph had they had to go through to find a place for them to stay for the first Christmas. They had no room at the inn. The third illustration is of the three kings, the three wise men from the east, led by the star, arrive at the manger to worship the newborn king of the universe. It can hold a votive candle inside or a three-inch pillar candle that you can add to make it more elegant. It will be a wonderful teaching aid for you to tell the stories of Christmas to your children. A wonderful and elegant gift for you and your loved ones. We want to give you this gift for your gift of $20 or more. Call the number on the screen right now and place your order today. 
and make your Christmas a special one with the light of Christ through the votive candle holder. Call today. The conversation we've had has been very, very en enriching. And, and I believe that many people are going to be blessed by what you've shared, and, and I thank you for that. But uh, you shared too much, and so we're going to have to spill over into two programs and, and uh, allow people for a couple of weeks to be able to, to get that insight and that. that. But what I, what I appreciated in what you've said is that you've, you've kind of touched the nerve, I think, of all of us is we're all searching for God's will, and we're all searching for knowing what can be the real meaning of our life. And quite simply, it's Jesus. It's, it's finding in Christ the fullness of everything that we're looking for. And worth, it's worth giving your life completely to that quest in a neat way. Some of the people that are looking for that searching are people who have written in to us. We, we, uh, I encourage you, please, if you would, to pick up the phone and, and, and pray with us. Pray for these people who have called in. And if you have some intention or if you'd like to really make sure that our ministry continues with your donations, get in touch, will you? And do this. Make sure you also watch our app, this iGod Today. Every day, there's a, on, your, on your iPhone and your Android, there's a special message from the gospel. Listen to it. Allow yourself to be blessed. And uh, pray for us. But here's some beautiful, beautiful intentions. Pray along with me. Joan, she's from Alabama healing, and she has financial recovery. Karen from Colorado, healing and uh, an illness in her body that's causing all kinds of pain. Uh, Janice from California, uh, my, my test came out good, so we're going to give a praise report for that. Sherry from Illinois, she's looking for a financial miracle, <laughs> also health and, and medical and safety, and she has a terrible toothache. Uh, Joan from Colorado, a friend who needs a, a new job. And finally, Phyllis, her son Travis, um, he's really struggling with anger. And I've got to share a personal one, a dear friend of mine. His name is Jerry Berry. Jerry has been a dear friend for many, many years, almost 30 years. He has a, a deep problem with cancer. I was visiting him in the hospital, and he just recently had a big surgery. Let, let's pray for, for Jerry and others. Lord, you're a God of miracles. You, you're a God who enters into situations that seem impossible and there's nowhere to turn. You can bring about a change into these people's lives, into their bodies, into their souls, into their spirits, and into their, and into their relationships. Do that now, Lord. Thank you very much. And may Jesus' love for you always make you smile.